Hi, folks. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, first thing in the morning. Um, apologies in advance. I woke up at 2 a.m. today. The jet lag is real. Uh, and I'll start with a little bit of background about the kernel's uh, stable and LTS story. Um, so the kernel, about 20 years ago, declared that every release that Linux does is stable. That means that we see a two-week two, uh, merge window, and then we see about seven to eight weeks of release candidates where we try to fix all the issues introduced by the merge window. Uh, what does it mean to be stable? It means that after Linux cuts its release, we're taking that kernel and we maintain it until the next release is out. So for about 10 months, we take all the bug fixes that go into the next release, and we put them into the older one, and we're hoping it, uh, it's something that helps users gain confidence in upgrading to that uh, previously released kernel version. Now, uh, an LTS is a bit different. With LTS, we take usually the last release of the year, we deem it as LTS, and at that point, we do the same process of backporting bug fixes from Linux's tree back onto this LTS kernel. And we we'll do this over a period of two to about six years. Depends on how much interest there is in that specific kernel. Uh, sometimes it's two, sometimes it's four, sometimes it's six. Depends on the community and its interests. Um, why are we doing LTS, right? It, it, it's not obvious because we just said that every, every release Linux does is stable, right? Um, the single most important thing to the kernel community is its users. It goes above everything. No new shiny features, no new shiny device support. The, the, really the only thing the kernel community cares about is that users have a great experience using the kernel. And LTS trees or LTS kernels are really this admission that the process we have with upstream is not perfect. We still have bugs sneaking in, we still have issues going into the upstream tree, and some users find it difficult to use the upstream tree. And so to accommodate for those users, we take this uh, project, which is called the LTS trees, where we try and make a more stable um, kernel, and we pay the price of doing that whole work of backporting, and those users who do not see new features come up until they update to the next LTS tree. Really, the, what we want to get to the point is that users are happy using this kernel, that they're confident, from they're confident to upgrade from one version to another. They're not afraid of being stuck on this ancient kernel just because something might break. Uh, we want the, the kernel that those users use to have all the fixes that landed upstream. There's literally thousands of fixes landing every release cycle. And we want those fixes to get to users' kernels as soon as we could possibly land them there. And we also want those users to not just be conf not just to regress w when they're upgrading, but also to feel to feel confident to upgrade to every single release that we do. So we release about once or twice a week. There's a new LTS release, and we really encourage all users to pick up that release, run it through their tests, run it through their uh, qualification environment, and then roll that kernel out to the production environment. Um, why is doing LTS hard, right? Um, the kernel is fairly unique. It's uh, the single biggest open source project in the world. We see over 10,000 release, uh, we see over 10,000 new patches in, in a period of 10 weeks. Linus in his keynote this morning mentioned that 6.7 was the biggest uh, release he ever saw commit-wise. And that means that the LTS folks have that many more commits to review uh, so they could ship them to their uh, users. Uh, we, even though the kernel is over 30 years old, uh, the kernel is still fast evolving. The systems and the architecture within the kernel are uh, changing rapidly. We see introduction of new uh, features, new ways of doing things, which, which also complicates backports. And I'll talk about all of it in the next couple of slides. Uh, we also have fairly limited resources doing this work. Many of us are working on the kernel for their companies individually and so on. Very few of us are paid or encouraged to work for the good of the community. And so we're trying to make a lot of this effort work with a very limited set of resources and people who do this work. And uh, as far as testing goes, it's improving. In the past couple of years, we've seen tremendous improvement in how we test and release kernels. Uh, up to five years ago, it was um, not the best shape. And even now, it still could use some more love and attention, and we were always trying to improve that process. 
so let's go over the issues I've uh, talked about in the previous slide to, in, in depth a little bit. Uh, the first one is, is those easy conflicts we all saw. So many of us try to take a patch from upstream, uh, put it on some older kernels, and we might have saw some conflicts here and there, probably simple stuff, there are context issues, maybe some spelling changes somewhere that, that uh, we need to take account of. And, and those changes seem to be simple, right? We could say it's fairly easy to take a bunch of these commits and kind of backport them to old trees. The tricky part is that this doesn't work at scale. There's only a few of us who can do this uh, manually. And if we see 10,000 commits every uh, release cycle, and let's say only a few thousands of them make it into the stable trees, and let's say only 10% of them have conflicts, it means we have to resolve in the hundreds of conflicts for every single um, LTS tree that we have. Time-wise, this is not something sustainable. We simply can't do this work. There's only so many hours in the day. Um, it's also the case that sometimes we look at something and we, when we think, well, this looks like a very trivial conflict and I'll just fix this up and I'll ship it. No one knows what's happening in the kernel. Um, and sometimes things that seem like a very easy trivial conflict are really not. Sometimes we miss context. Sometimes we're not familiar enough with the subsystem. And it's really easy to mess up something that looks like an easy conflict and break user systems. And we definitely don't want to do that. It's also the case that the older kernel trees get so if you look at kernel trees that are five, six, seven years old, there are drastically more trivial, simple conflicts that happened you know, as we backport patches to them, just because of how much they diverged from upstream. This divergence cost us in from having like very simple uh, cherry picks that just work into having to resolve tens or hundreds of conflicts every time we try a backport uh, a batch of patches back to LTS trees. Um, this is an interesting one. So the kernel is about 32 years old, and we still see major fundamental changes in the kernels. Uh, in the past year or two, we saw the introduction of folios, which is a new way to manage sets of memory pages. We saw major refactoring in the block layer, which deals with decades of technical debt. We saw the introduction of X-Array, which is there to improve uh, performance and scalability, which are wonderful features to have upstream. It's great to see how the upstream kernel can improve so drastically, even though the project is 30 years old. Um, the concern for the LTS trees here is that every time this new feature is introduced, we diverge from upstream in the, in the older LTS trees. So for example, in the 5.15 LTS tree, it will not have support for folios. It will not have support for X-Array, right? And what this means is that we now have this permanent divergence between two trees. And it causes two big issues. One is that further fixes that end upstream, for example, a fix in the memory management system that touches uh, something that works with folios is now not easy to backport to an older LTS tree. So any new fixes that land, that, that touch those features will not land in an LTS tree. It also means that sometimes we have issues in an older LTS tree, and those issues are inadvertently fixed by this change. So for example, a bug that was buried in the memory management code, and then the introduction of folios kind of solved it. And we see it a lot that uh, big refactoring brings new bugs, but it also fixes uh, many old bugs just because it's a new code base. And so what this means is that if you have code that's broken in 5.15 or an older LTS tree, it will just not get fixed because upstream has moved away from using that code whatsoever. So you're forever stuck with having those bugs. Um, I've previously talked about users, and this is kind of an, an umbrella for what I'll talk about next, is that we're doing this to provide our users infrastructure uh, which is critical for their uses, where it's, whether it's running workloads, running your media player, your cars, and whatnot. The, the big thing we care about is users, and what we're trying to do is find a way to balance our limited set of resources with trying to support as many users as we can who use the kernel. Um, and what we see is that with newer LTS trees, we have many users, right, because users upgrade and they adapt new trees, and they end up being mostly on... Uh, last like release or two or three 
and then the number of users tap tapers off rapidly as we get to old releases. So currently our oldest one is 414, and there's really just a handful of users who still care about it, and I can't wait to get rid of that release. Um, having said that, it's not the case that we don't care about the users who are on 414, we care about them deeply. It's just that when we, start, when we look at um, what we can do to support them, our, our options are fairly limited. Um, the first one is kind of the priorities of what maintainers and what patch authors see as, as important to them. Uh, we often see complex fixes that we want to backport to old trees. And we try them ourselves and we fail miserably. And then we try to find expertise in the field. We try to find people who, whether it's the author of the patch or whether it's the maintainer of the subsystem, to help us and try and both backport the patch and show us ways to test that backport. Um, which is a problem because, as Linus has mentioned in his keynote, maintainers are already overloaded and overburdened. And maintainers will respond favorably when we ask them to do this work for a kernel that has many users. So the recent LTS kernel trees will probably get help to get it done. So if I were to backport something to 6.6 from 6.7, maintainers would um, try and help us there because they know that doing this backport will benefit a huge amount of users. However, if I were to ask them to backport a fix from 6.7 to 4.14, and that fix isn't trivial, you'll get queued in there, very long queue, and it's very likely that they will never get to it because to them, they want to have the biggest impact they can have with their time. And when, when both developers and maintainers look at what they can do in the kernel world, the, really the best use of their time is doing development on the upstream tree. So fixing issues in Linux's tree, uh, developing new features, improving systems, any work they can do on the upstream tree, it's probably the, the best way to, to uh, send the resources to. After we've done this work, if we try and get to, uh, from the development tree, which is Linux's tree, to the tree that users actually use, which is one of the LTS trees, then those developers also see the value there. They recognize that creating a fix in, in the vacuum is not enough. So if, a fix, so if a fix only landed in Linus's tree, but didn't actually reach the users who need that fix, then we didn't really fix the issue, right? Uh, the fix is only still theoretical at that point. And so developers do appreciate that, and they do help us with doing these backports to recent kernel trees. Um, what we've seen really uh, going backwards is that the older the tree gets, the less maintainers care about it, both, both because the decrease in user count, but also because the delta between the old kernel trees and upstream has grown so much that doing this backport is very difficult. And, and I think we, those of us who try doing it, occasionally backporting a kernel patch from one version to the version prior, is fairly easy. There's usually not a good chunk of changes there. And usually we see small context changes and it's doable. If we're trying to do a backport to a kernel that's five years old, we have seen fundamental changes in the kernel. Some patches become nearly impossible to backport. Um, and developers also know that, and, and they sometimes might not even try and just ask users to upgrade to the latest tree. Um, the kernel, just like any other project, uh, has been around for a while. And just like any other project, uh, the kernel community is composed of people. And while the kernel tree has stayed with us uh, for 30 something years, some folks have done other things. Some folks have started working, for example, on a particular file system, and then they may have moved on to working on a different file system. They may have moved to work on a different subsystem altogether. Maybe they are moved from file systems to memory management, or maybe they moved to work on something else, which is not the kernel. Maybe they're retired, maybe they're working on Kubernetes, and now it's really hard to get to those developers. Um, and so we see within the kernel trees that we have subsystems and code, um, code chunks within the tree that are barely maintained. And when we see issues in those areas of the kernel, we find it very difficult to find the required expertise, both to create patches for those issues, but also to backport them. Because by the time we found someone who knows enough about the upstream code to help us, no one really knows what the, how the code looks like in a kernel that's five or 10 years old. And it's very hard to find folks who would spend the time and effort 
uh, to help an orphan subsystem or a completely deprecated subsystem to go backwards. Uh, an example here would be stuff like um, the Itanium deprecation, right? We just decided to kill it upstream because there's no expertise to maintain it. There's no machines to maintain it. And so if you're still using that on your older kernel trees, then you really have to upgrade your tree. Um, you really have to move to something that's not Itanium, let's say. Uh, another issue is testing, which I mentioned in the past. Uh, the kernel at this point has a good set of synthetic tests. We have many tests that uh, uh, that go through all the way from unit tests to like small functional testing. We have multiple test suites uh, that run and give us results, and they find real bugs. It's something that we didn't have five or ten years ago, and, and this effort is growing very quickly. Things like kernel CI, things like the zero day bot are really valuable in this effort. It's wonderful to see um, so many tests being run every time I push a commit to the stable queue, for example. And it's really great to, to, to it's a great way for us to gain confidence in the kernel before we release it. Uh, what is very difficult for us to get is real world testing, right? The things we do in practice in our companies, in our home, uh, to run our workloads or products is very different from synthetic tests. Like Unix Bench doesn't represent any real workload. It's great at finding the regressions in the scheduler. It's not great at catching issues that will mess up your production systems. Um, and, and we found it very hard to get feedback from real users on whether we're breaking their kernel or not. Uh, no one really wants to throw a half-baked kernel into their, into their production environment just to give us feedback. And, and so what it means is that we, we don't have great confidence before we release a kernel until, unless we get those signals. Uh, we don't know what each and every one of you run or use the kernel for, right? Some of it is cars, some of it is spaceships, and some of it is just you know, media servers in your home. And we really can't test for all those scenarios. We really don't know what people do with the kernel. And unless we hear back from folks, we can't help there. Um, we also see a case that people kind of hope that someone else will come and fix the problem for them or find the problem for them even, right? Linus does seven or eight release candidates and there's, there is definite participation in those, but, very, but most folks basically just wait until the kernel is released and then they kind of start testing it because they think at that point the kernel is in a good shape. But if you haven't tested that during those release candidate cycles, then it's very possible that the bug you care about wasn't fixed and then you're installing the kernel on your system and you will break it because you haven't tested it during the release candidate cycles. And then we see something very similar with the stable and LTS releases, because when we cut LTS release candidates, we definitely get feedback of, of users testing it both on large and small systems, but that feedback is very limited. And there's this hope that somehow the bug that you care about would be fixed by someone else. Um, this problem becomes worse the older the kernel gets, because as I said before, users really mostly run on the latest trees. There's a uh, diminishing amount of tests happening the older the kernel gets. We see quite a lot of feedback for the 6.6 tree currently and the 6.1 tree. If you look at the 4.14 tree or, or the 4.19 tree, only very few users actually test and report issues before they um, uh, before we are able to release it, which is very unfortunate because it means that we add bugs that we don't want to add into those uh, old kernels and we don't uh, know that we added them until it breaks a real system. Um, so maybe thinking about what we can do um, to improve this situation. And I think that um, when, when I started this talk or, or when I just chat with people about this, about how we can make stable kernels more stable and how we can make LTS kernels more stable, Usually I hear feedback that, well, we need to find a way to make those trees last for longer, right? So how do we make kernel trees um, stay active for two years, then for six years, 10 years, or how do we make them work for decades? Because that's what makes them stable, right? Like we think that if, if we don't change the underlying kernel for a decade, then suddenly <laughs> things will improve. And all we have to do is just find a way to make it happen. Um, and, and to me, that, that's, that's the opposite of what we want to do. We, we want to be able to support the trees where we have the most users, and we want to make sure that users are able to upgrade. 
Uh, the next one is that we want, I mentioned before that the more we diverge from stream, the difficult, the more difficult the process becomes. The harder it is to backport patches to it, the harder it is to test on it, and the harder it is to upgrade from that kernel. Because the bigger the delta is, the harder the upgrade process is, because you will be hitting so many more issues that weren't tested before. And that's why when we do the backports to the LTS trees, we try and take as much as we can into them in the form of dependencies. So if we have a fix and it depends on two other patches, we will take the fix and the two other patches, which might not be stable material, but we do that so we will diverge less from upstream. The less we diverge, the easier the maintenance effort becomes. And the same thing goes to our users. If you are using the LTS trees, take the whole LTS tree, even if you might not care about half of it, right? If you don't care about half of it, there's no harm in taking that half. And in the case that you are mistaken and you actually do care about a patch or two in that half, then you got a free fix for it, right? There's no reason to cherry pick out of the LTS tree whatsoever. Uh, and another thing is to be part of the effort and kind of come in and help. Uh, there's, for a project that is the biggest open source project in the world, we have so few folks who are actively participating in this release uh, workflow. And it will be great to see more folks and more help and more support there. Um, and this is for your own benefit, right? This happens for the benefit of the users at the end. And most of you here are the users. And if, we, and if you don't test what we release, then we can't promise that we won't break you. Because this is really the, the I believe that this is the only thing that the kernel community promises to its users, that it will never regress user space. And it's unfortunate to see that, that only so few users actually take advantage of that promise, because this is quite a strong promise, uh, and, and um, this is probably the most important thing to users, right? We want our workloads to keep working. We want our products to keep doing what they're doing. We want our cars to keep driving. Uh, and if I can take advantage of this promise, I would definitely do that. Uh, and, and so th this is a bit tricky because we're not trying to support more kernels for longer. We're not trying to get to the point where we can support 20 kernels over 20 years. This will be the opposite of where we're going for. What we want to do is to be able to support as few kernels. So we want to take a step back from, from the six year kernels we supported and try to cut it down to four and then see where it goes next. We want our users to be confident that they can upgrade. We want our users to, to run the latest LTS tree and we want them to upgrade to the next LTS tree when it's being released at the end of the year. So if we're on 6.6, uh, .6, which was just released, we really wish that most of our users would be running on this 6.6 tree. Um, the, the trick for getting away from very long kernel trees is just upgrading very often. Um, so this is all nice and great, but some of us can't just take our uh, products and upgrade them immediately. Uh, sometimes it would depend on the vendor. Sometimes it would depend on, on a bunch of other circumstances that prevent us from being able just to upgrade to the latest uh, LTS tree. Um, and, and so while we say that, that it's, it's something that you should be doing. You should be upgrading to the latest LTS tree and you should be uh, maybe even trying to use the latest stable tree as far as you can. It's, it's really hard. And so some of the ways I would suggest to, to improve that process for, for like yourselves is the first one is invest in your testing story. This is probably the single most important thing that the project can do for itself. Uh, the Linux kernel has realized that over the past 10 years and there's this massive improvement in a testing story the kernel has, and we definitely saw uh, issues going away. Even going back to about 20 years ago, systems like LogDep, for example, when uh, SMP was introduced, helped eliminate classes of bugs uh, that would have otherwise bitten us for forever. This investment into testing infrastructure, into tests, and, and the testing story overall is very important both to the Linux kernel as a project and to you all as users. This is critical. Um, and I kind of split it up into three parts. The first one is quick small tests. Um, it, it would be really great if you can uh, be in sync with the kernel community releases. So if when, when Linux does his release candidates, it would be great if you can take them and test them out on your products to make sure it doesn't regress. 
when we do the LTS release candidates. It's wonderful if you can take your product and make sure that, that it still runs on that latest released release candidate. Uh, next one is whole system test, and it's something that's been very difficult uh, to get. If there is a way where you can run your product, your system, whatever it is, and find a way to give feedback, both to the upstream community as well as to the LTS community, if things still work or if things still break, and it's, it's fine to say, hey, I saw you release this release candidate, I tried my thing and it works. This is an awesome feedback. Things are working great, perfect. You don't have to wait until issues come up, even just to hear that things are still working fine, it's really, really valuable. Um, and and the, the wider those tests are, the better the result is both for the kernel community as well as for the users. The more code paths we can exercise, the better it is uh, in the long term to keep the stability of the kernel tree, both for ourselves and our users. Uh, the last one is, is bisection, and, and we saw it a lot with the, uh, both in the upstream community and the LTS tree, is that users sometimes see an issue uh, when they upgrade. They might have upgraded to, to the latest kernel tree, and something broke for them. And, and just because we don't know what everyone are doing with the kernel, it's very hard for upstream developers to dig into uh, what broke. Sometimes we see a random file system corruption or crashes, null pointed references. Sometimes they're easier to debug, but sometimes they're very, very tricky. And from my observation, many of the issues that are not easy to reproduce are getting lost just because we don't know what everyone are doing with the kernels. So developing the ability to bisect within the kernel tree and, and run those tests on your products is really valuable. You will get a much better response if you are able to go to the upstream community and say, hey, my, my workload broke and this is the commit that broke it. Can you please help me fix it? This is much better than just saying, hey, my workload broke. So developing the ability to do bisections is really, really important. Um, if we can't upgrade, let's say we have this limitation where we can't go from one LTS to another, but we still want to make sure that, that we have that path forward. One thing we can do is, and I've been doing it in my uh, capacity working in Google, is, is being able to run a set of our workloads on the latest LTS tree. So maybe we don't run the whole, um, the, the, the entirety of, of the workloads on the latest LTS tree, we might run 1% or 2% or 5% of our workloads on that LTS tree. It's a great way for us to weed out issues uh, in that tree to make sure that they don't affect your product, but also for you as users, it's a great way to make sure that you have the path of upgrading from one tree to the other open. Because if you know that your workload can run on the latest LTS tree, then you know that you have the option of upgrading, that you're not blocked on something unknown because the worst thing to do here is to say, hey, I'm stuck on 5.4 for whatever reason, and I'm not sure why, but I can't upgrade. This is really a bad state to be in. So doing this proactively, just to shake out the, the, the bugs that show up in the latest LTS tree is a wonderful way to make sure that you have a path forward to upgrade. Another thing I've observed is that sometimes we're forced to do an upgrade. Sometimes the, the, uh, the the stars align and maybe the upstream LTS tree goes end of line, end of life, or sometimes we need a new feature that exists only in the latest LTS tree. Sometimes we, it might be a new product that we design and we decide to use whatever kernel version. And then at that point, we invest the efforts to move into that kernel and to stabilize it. And what I'm suggesting is, is that once we've made this jump, let's say we've upgraded from 5.10 to 6.1, and let's say we're happy in 6.1, don't take your foot off the gas pedal. If you're at 6.1, great, you've accomplished that upgrade. How do I get to the next kernel version? How do I go to 6.6? I already have, I already know how to do this. I already did this right now. Go, jumping up one kernel version, let's keep doing it to get all the way to the end. Uh, this is a really great way to, to um, kind of create this culture of being able to upgrade on an annual cadence or maybe even more often. It also becomes very easy to upgrade if the delta is small. So, so going from a really ancient kernel to a really new kernel is difficult because there's so much more content, there's so much more new code that wasn't tested on your systems. It's really complicated. You will be hitting so many issues. And, and the more issues you hit at once, the more difficult it is to fix them. If you hit 10, 10 separate issues all at once, you will have a hard time finding which issues are those really are and splitting them into individual ones and then fixing them. Where if you go from 
where if the delta is small and you jump from one kernel to the next and you might hit only two issues and fixing those two issues is fairly straightforward because just how small they are because the number is so small the the the, the, the more the number grows the, the effort needed grows exponentially to address them uh, the, the last one is to report stuff uh, we have seen so many cases of users who are stuck on an old kernel and they have never told anyone they have never said anything upgrading like some users are stuck on like 510 and when they tried to upgrade it broke their graphics card so they never did and they just decided to stay on 510 no one knows uh, and no one can help them and so it's very important for us to be able to hear from you to get feedback and, and this is really Going back to the first slide, this is all about the users. This is all about you. You need to tell us if things are working or they're not working. And we're really trying uh, to get as much feedback back as we can. Even if you just tell us, hey, things are working great for us, that's wonderful. But just please test and report it back. Um, yeah. Thank you. If you have other questions, comments. Uh, thank you for your great talk. Um, so I'm working for the uh, embedded product and what prevents us to use the uh, upstream kernel is uh, so-called uh, vendor kernels, uh, which is pro uh, maintained by the SOC suppliers. So I, I think it makes uh, really huge uh, fragmentation mm. and is there any uh, kind of activities on that program or maybe uh, some uh, suggestions to deal it, with it? Yep, uh, th this is definitely an issue we've been trying to tackle. Uh, I saw it myself many times. I think that, that Greg has been putting up an effort in the past decade or so with working with vendors and trying to get them to do the right thing has been running around mm -hmm. between vendors, countries, entities trying to get them to be aligned with the LTS tree. And I think we're slowly getting there. I think that if you have a certain vendor that is not playing well, you can try and contact in us directly to try and, uh, in all seriousness. Uh, we'll be trying to get everyone on the same page. And, and I, I, I'll tell you about a case earlier this year where I felt really good with myself. We're working with a certain vendor who is actually ahead of us, of the product. <laughs> I manage, and they were complaining to me that, that uh, hey, why are you using the Sentient 6.1 kernel? You need to upgrade. Uh, so, so we're slowly getting there, but unfortunately, this all comes back to the relationship you have with that vendor. If you can push that vendor to uh, be better aligned with upstream, that's great. We've seen uh, cases where companies do it on a contractual basis, where, where part of your contract is that you have to, make, you have to upgrade within a certain amount of weeks after the release of the upstream LTS and uh, also pressuring vendors to upstream their code because you're stuck with the vendor tree because it has so much out of tree code. If you get that vendor to upstream all that code, your life will be much easier. Thank you so much. I think it's quite interesting that you mentioned that when we upgrade our kernel, the GPU breaks. So is there, um, I think that's one of the things that's stopping us because we are an R&D company. And then we try to test the, uh, sometimes you try to use a newer kernel and then with a different CUDA version. And then things always break. So that's what's stopping us from always upgrading to the latest LTS. Mm -hmm. So uh, is there anything working in the, on your side or on the back end side that is uh, like providing an archive saying that this new kernel supports this version of the GPU, things like that. Or because these are, I think, very prominent uh, challenges that is stopping us from always upgrading our, our, uh, our kernel. So what do you suggest? Yeah, uh, so we recently have something called the regression tracker upstream, uh, which is a way for us to say that, hey, a certain functionality broke at a certain point. And we try and keep track of that. So I would say that if you try to upgrade and you saw that a certain piece of hardware break, you can report it. There's a regression mailing list 
and there's a very great community of people who try and help there and they help us to try and track down those breakages, right? Because it shouldn't be the case that some GPUs work with some kernel versions. It should be the case that all GPUs work with all kernel versions, right? And so if at some point a certain GPU worked with a kernel and then it stopped working, then we want to find out why and we want to fix it. So we have the regression mailing list. Uh, I think it's regressions that, um, I'll find it, I, I can find it for you later. And it's a great, just report issues there and we'll try and fix them. And it really helps if you can pinpoint the specific kernel where things broke or the specific commit where things broke, because it sounds like you would be able to bisect the issue, right? Um, and just those reports are really valuable. Thanks, Sasha, for your for your important points. Uh, share most of them. Um, I have a question: How do you measure your users of the older kernels? Also, given that some of them are indirect users, um, the, the challenge always is with users: they don't only speak up when something is broken. At most, sometimes even not then. Um, and I guess the LTS kernel is also indirectly used quite heavily um, downstream by you mentioned them vendor kernels, but also in-house kernels, which are based on LTS at least. So do you have some numbers on that? We, we, we don't, we have no like kernel communities and like we don't know who does what. Uh, our guesstimates of how many users we have are based both on what you said of how many users come and say that we're using it, but also on uh, our, our kind of knowledge of the world. So we know, for example, Android uses this kernel version, no, Chrome uses that kernel version. A lot of it is, is guesstimates that we have to know where we are, but, but that's why we're asking for feedback from users. We want folks to come back and tell us, hey, I'm using this kernel version, it works for me. This is an awesome feedback, it's so appreciated, and, and I don't think as many people realize just how good it is. Hi, thanks for a good talk. So I think one of the indirect motivation of using an old kernel is that people want to use old distro because they don't want incompatibility inside user land. For example, they want to use an old GCC package that is supported on old Debian. So they use old kernel without knowing. Uh, do you have any insights about that? Yep, uh, so about 12 years ago, uh, there was a um, kernel summit in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And the one thing that came out from that summit was what's called the Cambridge Promise. And Linux, Linus stated very clearly, the kernel will never break user space. The single thing that the kernel community promises to user space, it will not break it. If you see cases where upgrading to a new kernel version breaks your user space, and it's a real scenario, right? You have a real user space package that stops working as you upgraded your kernel, please report to it. Linus has gone through above and beyond to fix these issues. He reverted the entire patches of code, he did crazy things to make user space keep working. This is the number one priority of the kernel. So if you don't feel comfortable upgrading because you're afraid the user space will break, go like, if you identify such an issue, please, please, please report it. Yeah, sorry, I, I know about the, the promise, but yeah. uh, people, if they want, can upgrade the kernel that is used by all distro, but the only way they can upgrade the kernel is upgrading the whole distro because they don't have an ability to build it, a kernel by themselves. It, it, at that point, it depends on your distro vendor. Um, at that point, you should pressure your distro vendor to help you or upgrade to a new version of the distro. Um, that, that, that's kind of the relationship between you and your distro. Yeah, thank you. Next to me. Uh, I'm a Debian developer, so I want yeah. to say about the Debian. Uh, Debian used the uh, only late, uh, LTS kernels, not to, not to old kernel versions. So, and uh, we provide the uh, uh, backport L uh, kernel packages, mm -hmm. so you can use the uh, uh, newer kernel versions without upgrading whole distros. Yes, in general, I would recommend using um Distros are similar as Debian rather than more enterprise distros that tend to be stuck on a kernel that's 10 years old uh, and it's kind of Franken kernel that barely keeps chugging along. Uh, Debian has been a great part of the community and, and I wish that more distros would be 
uh, with doing it as, as well as Debian does. Uh, hi, Sasha. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, so what do you think is the sweet spot for uh, the uh, LTS tenure support? Four years? Or? <laughs> depends on the community. Uh, it's, it's really not up to us, right? It, it depends on how much the, the, commu the community is there or not. It, it, it's not like something that... that okay. Yeah. If, if the people are there, we'll support it. But, but so far, it doesn't look like enough people care about old kernels, which is fine. Yeah, typically it depends on the sector, like auto customers tend to stick on for long. Uh, some of the customers uh, want a migration every year. So, okay. Yeah. And I think we're running out of time. So I will call it. Um, thank you very much.